Hey, what is up? This is Jake Hofer with Exodus Trail Cameras. On this week's episode of Whitetail Cribs, we are making our first pit stop in Oklahoma. It is stop number one of nine. The team drove 3,000 miles to record these episodes and they turned out great. One of the guests was, as you guys guessed, Roger Raglan. We're gonna be saving that for later this year, so be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notification so when it goes live, you will see it first. This episode is with Steve and Bryce. They are Oklahoma natives and they share some of their favorite stories over the years, some really good deer that they killed and also share some turkey hunting uh, stories and fans and spurs uh, given the time of year. I'm about to roost a bird hopefully tonight here in Illinois, so I gotta get going. Hope you guys enjoy the video. If you do, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe. Now let's go. Hey guys, come on in. Welcome to the Scroggins house. I'm uh, Steve Scroggins. Uh, we're here in Orlando, Oklahoma, and this is my son, Bryce Scroggins. And come on in and we'll start showing you guys around. Uh, we'll run back here to the bedroom first. This is our guest room. Uh, anybody that comes and visits, they stay in here. But we got quite a few deer in here and uh, all my son's turkey stuff. A lot of fans he's killed were, uh, were just about as big a turkey hunters as we are deer hunters. But got lots of spurs. I uh, got an antelope here I killed uh, several years ago, but it measured uh, 15 inches. So it's a really nice antelope. I'm proud of him. We'll uh, head on back out and we'll go to the main room y'all came to see. I guess I gotta stop here on the way too. Uh, here's three more deer. These are all my dad's. He doesn't have anywhere to hang them. He's uh, 76 years old, has Parkinson's, and doesn't get to hunt anymore. But uh, he uh, still likes listening to the stories and telling them to us. But uh, So I'm proud to hang them in my house also. This here is my man cave. This is where <laughs> we spend, uh, if we're here at the house, we spend 90% of our time. We'll go ahead and jump into it and get started. Uh, this right here, is the very last turkey my dad uh, was able to kill a few years back. My brother made a telefan display for him. We're happy to have that here. He's definitely proud of it. Over here, this is my display of turkeys. This is a tail display I built. Uh, I've got a wing, wing bone call on there that uh, my good friend Ernie Calandrelli uh, made for me. Some of you may have heard of him. He works for Quaker Boy Game Calls. This picture here, this is me and my son a couple of years ago doubling up on turkeys. It was an awesome morning. And this, the turkey I just showed you that was my dad, this is my dad here and my brother and my nephew. And that was the la very last turkey he got to kill. So uh, that was a special memory there. Moving on over here to the corner. This is the biggest body deer I've ever killed. And he's one of the few bucks in here that's not from Oklahoma. He was uh, actually killed him in Illinois, and he uh, field dressed 245 pounds. So he was, he was definitely an old deer. Made, got him with a bow. He was, uh, didn't go very far, went down on film. I think he didn't have any teeth in his mouth. I think he was really old, really short-timed. I would love to have seen him a few years before. I think he would have been a lot bigger, but he still scored 145 as a mainframe eight. So next. Uh, this is another buck that I killed in Illinois. These two actually kind of go hand in hand. Uh, you can tell from the genetics that they're obviously brothers or same gene pool. And I killed them in back-to-back -back years. This one right here, we uh, killed him. It was raining one evening and had been raining all day. And it finally stopped about an hour before daylight or before dark. And uh, me and my brother, well, he was actually filming me that night. And he said, let's go jump in a tree. So we had a, had a tree fairly close to camp that we went and jumped in and no more than got in the stand. And he walked out and he walked up and faced me for seemed like 15 minutes, never moved. And there was an alfalfa field and he was actually waiting on does to come into the field, I think, and was just standing there waiting. Uh, he finally gave me a shot, got him with my bow also, and he scores right at 150. I think it was 149. 
This one was on the same farm in Illinois. I also shot him with my bow. I didn't make the best shot on him. I hit him a little bit high and uh, had a really good blood trail for a while. And then it just uh, went to nothing. And we searched for days and never found him. And actually I killed this buck the next year. And then my brother and a friend were hunting and he was filming my brother. And they're sitting in the tree stand uh, one morning uh, over watching a draw uh, by a pond. And my buddy taps my brother on the shoulder and said, pointed down at the ground and they could see a rack sticking out of the leaves. And they didn't think too much of it. And when they uh, got down later that morning, they went over and pulled it up out of the ground and leaves. And as soon as they pulled it out of the ground, uh, my brother said, that's Steve Spuck from last year. And sure enough, it was. And he'd went the total opposite direction uh, from what we had searched. Uh, he must have made a big circle and just never found him. But uh, I was thrilled to death to find him, even though it was a year later. You can kind of see on his antlers from laying in the mud and the uh, leaves around the pond, he, uh, he's kind of faded, and I just left him that way. I think it's a cool story how we found him, but uh, definitely, definitely happy to get him. This is a table I built and uh, for sheds, got a shadow box in it, uh, got it full. Well, not full. I'm still working on filling it with sheds, but uh, got a ways to go. But uh, this one here, this is the best shed. And uh, we actually found it in Kansas, uh, me and my brother. And uh, got double drops, got stickers coming out everywhere. Just a really cool buck. He's been chewed on by squirrels a little bit, but uh, it goes really good on top of this table. Moving on, this is my very first big buck. It's like the third buck I ever killed. I killed him here in Oklahoma with a rifle. I actually went to the stand early one morning. I was in college uh, down around Ada, Oklahoma, went to East Central University and got up. It was uh, the day before Thanksgiving. I was out of school, so I got up and went hunting and I went to climb in my stand that morning and I was had the uh, screw in steps and one of my steps actually pulled out of the tree and I didn't fall very far. I only fell a couple feet, but I made all kinds of racket. And uh, as soon as I did, there's deer snorting up the ridge. And so I'm mad, you know, I get the step screwed back in and I'm thinking, you know, my morning's over. I've done spooked everything. And, uh, but they stay up there and they keep snorting. And I was I only been hunting three or four years at the time and I pulled out my grunt call, grunted, uh, let's see if I could calm him down. And it wasn't like 30 seconds later, I see this buck walking down the hill. He walked right in uh, like 30 yards and I shot him and I thought I'd completely missed. He showed no signs of being hit and he run off up the hill, tail flagging. So I, I was kicking myself. I thought I missed that deer. Uh, I gave him like 30 minutes though and I climbed down and right at the blood or at the side of the shot uh, there was blood easy track job so I, I ended up killing him he just uh, I was only shooting a 243 at the time and uh, he sucked it up and went on like he uh, wasn't even hit but uh, like I said that was for a long time that was my second biggest buck uh, he scored 151 this is another buck I killed uh, in Illinois and he uh, was uh, like one of the first deer I ever killed up there and at the time I was used to Oklahoma deer uh, and the farms we hunted around uh, didn't have the best deer and so when I went up there I thought this thing was a giant. He is a good deer but uh, if he'd had another couple of years he would have been a true giant. Uh, we uh, think he was only three and a half years old but as a 10 point, you can already see he had great mass and uh, had, had a lot of potential. So uh, this next buck is a buck I killed here in Oklahoma. He's uh, tall and tight. I actually killed him with a muzzleloader. That was a long, long night. I shot him right before dark and uh, hit him back a little bit. And uh, like they typically do, left not hardly any kind of blood trail. And so we uh, gave him a while, went back, oh, 10 o'clock at night, I think it was, and found that deer about three hours later. He, uh, 
he went a long ways before he ever laid down. But uh, he, uh, he had scored 153, and until two years ago, he was my biggest deer for a long time. Uh, he's got long tines. He's just really tight. So really a really nice deer. This is a deer my son killed here in Oklahoma and was actually his very first uh, good deer. So he was still pretty young. He'd killed a few deer, but uh, never anything very big. And uh, so we were actually about five miles west of here on a farm. And typically, as typical teenagers do, he's uh, asleep at daylight, right as it's, uh, the sun's coming up. And as soon as it got where I could see, I saw this deer coming across the ridge to us. So I reach over and I uh, tap him on the shoulder, get him woke up, and I said, there's a buck coming. And I already knew which deer it was. We had him on trail camera, and, but I didn't tell him which deer it was. And I, I, I didn't even tell you it was a buck. And he finally saw it, saw it was a buck. And he said, Dad, that's a buck. And I was like, yeah. And then it walked out in the clearing and he could tell which buck it was. And he's like amazed at the size of the buck because the first words out of his dad mouth was, uh, Dad, it's a buck. And then, Dad, it's a big buck. <laughs> and uh, he actually come in. Uh, you know, we carry rifles around here in Oklahoma a lot. Uh, and you expect to shoot long range. But as the case with us, most of our rifle shots end up being under 100 yards. He shot this deer at uh, 25 yards out of a ground blind. And he actually had to wait on killing the deer uh, until it cleared my trail camera. <laughs> so the chest was covered up by the trail camera for a long time. And the deer kind of come in, got nervous as big deer usually do. And uh, so he knew something was up, but he was done too far gone. He took one step past the camera and Bryce uh, let him have it. He didn't go any, anywhere, just went down in the creek and uh, expired. And uh, 137, is that what he scored? So yeah, that's Bryce's first big deer. This here, I just talked about us being big turkey hunters. And this is a boat paddle from uh, Quaker Boy Game Calls uh, made by Dick Kirby. A lot of turkey hunters will recognize that name. And he actually signed it for me. And cool story behind that is uh, when he gave it to me, I thought, man, that's too pretty to take to the woods and turkey hunt with. So I put it on a shelf, it stayed there for years. And then a few years back, uh, Dick passed away. And uh, somebody told me, you know, he said, that's uh, too good a call to never use. So I took it to the turkey woods one time, called in three long beards and they just hammered. After that, it was retired for good. It had done its job in the turkey woods. That last hunt with Brandon, couldn't have been any prettier, and I said, it's got to get retired on that one right there. Then, this is my biggest deer right here, my personal best, and I killed him two years ago. And I killed him on October 3rd, uh, really early in the season. October 1st is when our season comes in, and on that day, it was like 90 degrees, and the next day, October 2nd, was the same. And, but they were forecasting a really big cold front to come in on October 3rd. So I stayed out of the woods until then and went in early that evening. And as luck would have it, uh, two does come out and I was watching them. They were right underneath me. And all of a sudden they just took off running. And I'm sitting on a little wheat field food plot. And I'm like trying to figure out what spooked them. And they kind of split. And when they split, I just looked up across the field and this guy is coming in on a dead run. And I'm sitting in a cedar tree. I love to put stands in cedars uh, for scent control, uh, but they're a little hard to shoot out of when the deer's right under you. So I had this deer at like five steps for about 10 minutes. And he uh, was luckily on the upwind side of me, never knew I was there. He kind of was confused, I think, as why the deer or the two does took off running like they did. And he just stood there kind of nervous, but then he turned and he walked back out into the food plot and I shot him at 10 yards. And uh, Bryce was actually in a stand not too far from me. And as soon as I called and I told him I shot the big 10, he was like, I'm on my way. He climbed out and gave up the last bit of his hunt to come help me. Uh, it wasn't laying like 50 yards away we found him. So uh, really proud of this deer. He's got a really cool spike coming off 
uh, inside here, got a split brow. Uh, this deer ended up scoring. He was a 160 class deer, but with all the extra brow and that extra point, he went 173. So uh, by far my biggest deer. The same year I killed this deer on that small food plot, uh, my nephew killed a 165 uh, during rifle season. And then a week later, my son killed this deer, which went 152. Uh, so we killed three deer all over 150 uh, that year, just an incredible deer. And they all come off a three acre food plot. My name's Bryce, uh, this is my dad Steve over here. This is our trophy room. And um, this is my personal biggest deer. And I shot him, it was my freshman year of college and I got out of class early one day and just decided I was gonna run home and try to hunt real quick, about a 45 minute drive up at Tonkawal. So I drove back here and just hopped in a blind and there wasn't anything on the field. It was the, almost the end of the night. And then I look over towards the edge of the food plot and right there in the CRP grass, I just see antlers just coming up over the top of it. And he actually stands there and I watch him and I watch him feed back and forth until I can get a shot for, feels like forever, but it's probably just a couple minutes. Um, I finally shoot him and call my dad and he's freaking out almost as much as I am, if not more. And he comes over there and we, we end up finding him. He didn't go 60, 70 yards. And the first thing I remember my dad saying is, what did you do? He looks at me and says, what did you do? Because at that time, that was bigger than anything he'd ever killed either. So he was pretty jealous of that one when it happened. This deer down here is another one of mine. I killed it actually just about four miles to the north of here. That one was really interesting. I was, it was about 70 degrees that day, just early rifle season. And I actually saw him on the neighbors and I was trying to decide if he was going to come over there or not. And then he acted like he was going to walk down this draw that we had. So I kind of got down out of my stand. It's a bad idea. Don't ever do that. At that time, I had a, about a four year or a four point, about a two year old deer walk past me at probably 10 yards. And luckily enough, he didn't spook and I got back up in my tree. And then right before I got down, that deer came out and I shot him. That was my biggest deer for probably three or four years until I ended up killing that deer. So I've got this eight point over here. I actually shot him in the exact same place as I shot the uh, deer that was my biggest for a long time over there with the split G2. They were standing in the exact same place, 365 days apart, and I was sitting in the exact same stand. Only difference was that one ran, and this one, as soon as I shot him, he just stood up on his back legs and fell over backwards. So that was a really cool one, and uh, made it even better. I got to call my dad while he was at work and tell him that I, I needed him to come help me load a deer. So that one was fun. All right, and then I've got this one over here. This was actually my 16th, my sweet 16th birthday present from my Uncle Mark. He helps run a guide service out in Wheeler, Texas. And when I turned 16, he offered me and said, hey, you want to come out and hunt over Christmas break whenever you have some time off from sports and everything? So I said, yeah, sure. And we went out there, and of course, a big snowstorm hits while we're out there. And we finally get to hunt. We're hunting in knee-deep snow in Texas for some reason. And... So this deer comes out, and he come, actually comes out with a, a two-year-old mule deer with him. And I end up shooting him, and we, try to, we go back and get the truck, and we try to get it back there, and we manage to get the truck stuck in the snow on the way back there. And whenever, so then we have to go back to town, and about 30 minutes later, we got some chains, got the truck pulled out, and got the deer. By the time we did that, within that 30 minutes, um, Everything from his jawbone back had been completely torn apart by coyotes. So this is new. This is a uh, replacement pelt I got, but just a, a really cool story and just a really great 16th birthday present. Right down here, this one was actually my biggest deer for a long time whenever I was younger. That one was actually supposed to be my dad's morning to hunt, but he decided that he would take one for the team since he didn't want to shoot a busted up deer and give it to the kid, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> it's a charity case that morning. My last two deer I've got, I shot, I got both of these. I'm really proud of both of them. I shot them in the same year. Um, they both went over 150. This one was 150 even. This one was 152 and I shot them 14 days apart. I shot this one. It was 75 degrees and it was a, a Saturday. And I went, decided to go hunting, and about 15 minutes into the hunt, I hear the feeder go off. 
And I hear that, and so I text. I go to text my dad to let him know that you know everything's still full and we don't need to fill anything. And uh, then I I look up from my phone and he's standing there at 4:45 in the afternoon, 75 degrees. So I just I stand up and I never even knew that deer existed until I checked the cameras that morning. And then 12 hours later, I had him dead. And then we got this one right over here. I shot him two weeks after this one on the exact same plot that we shot multiple other 150 inch deer just prior in that season. Um, I actually had packed my lunch to sit all day that day and I had some peanut butter sandwiches and a Gatorade ready for the day. And it was about eight o'clock and next thing I know he walks out and I didn't ever have to eat the peanut butter sandwiches. That was the best part. I got to call him and he got to skip his full day hunt too. He wasn't too happy about that one, but we got to kill that. And that was the f only time that either one of us has ever killed 300 inches in the same season. Thank y'all for coming. I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, my man cave, but uh, it's getting late in the day. We got turkeys to roost, so y'all guys got to get out of here.